Hello guys, welcome back to physics. Good to see you. And um, today, what are we gonna do? Well, a little bit more on forces. So our plan for today is to understand moments, center of mass, scalars, vectors, momentum, and impulse. Okay, so quite a lot to cover. So let's see how we get on. Let's have a quick flick around here and um, go to this screen. Right, here we are, people. So, moments. All right, it's difficult because moments mean like, wait a moment, but we don't think of that in physics. A moment is something else. A moment is the force times the distance, okay? When we apply a force on something over a distance, that creates a turning effect, and that is called a moment. So let me just flick across here, all right? So we've got to give some examples of some turning forces. And guys, a key, a key is creating the turning force. When we put it in and turn it, when the key is turned, we're applying a force to it and we're applying it over a distance. Okay, if the key was only, if the key was only this wide, it would be really difficult to turn it. That's why we have this nice big lever on here. Okay, that's a turning force. Okay, guys, so keys, right? A screwdriver, when we use a screwdriver, we're turning it like this. Okay, that's creating a moment. Right? Now, an, a logical thing, something much easier to see would be a spanner, all right? If we had a spanner and we were using that, we would be applying a force, there'd be a nut or a bolt at this end here, and we'd be applying a force here at the top, and the force is being applied over a distance, over a length, and it's the force times the length which gives us the moment, okay? There's lots of different examples, okay? They can be quite obtuse. We've done the screwdriver, even a knife. When we're cutting with a knife, we're applying a force, over a distance, okay? The force is being applied over a distance. And guys, we, we can go on, all right? We can go on for ages with this. Now, I've even brought my fishing rod in, or one of my fishing rods, okay? So look, force on the reel, we apply a force over a distance, okay? And even the fishing rod, okay? When the fish is on the end, they're pulling away, okay? The fish is, is pulling on the end of the lever, Okay, and it's pulling one way and I'm pulling back. So this is this is rotating around the end here. And even this is using moments. Right, I think I just, I didn't dent the ceiling, but the fishing rod was making a break for it. So guys, those are examples of moments, right? The principle of moments is dead easy. Think of a seesaw, all right? And the principle of moments is this. We've got um, a seesaw like this. It's got a fulcrum around in the middle. Doesn't need to be in the middle, could be anywhere. We got a weight on one side, a weight on the other side. We can call this force one, we can call this force two, all right? Whatever the distances are, that's going to be distance one. This will be distance two, okay? Now, it could be a seesaw, it could be a fishing rod, it doesn't matter what it is, but there'll be somewhere a point where it turns there'll be a weight or a force at each end. And when balanced, when balanced, now we can't say downward forces guys, because this one's acting down and this one's acting down. But if you think of a clock, this one's going clockwise and this force is going anti-clockwise. Okay, so when balanced, watch the anti-clock, wise moment is equal to the clock wise moment you can use this abbreviation in an exam there's not a problem with that all right and usually in the exam you'll be told maybe three of the things and then you figure out the fourth so we end up with f1 d1 equals f2 times d2 rearrange it get your answer just make sure you measure it from the fulcrum and it's the perpendicular distance from the fulcrum, okay? 
right? Because if this was at an angle like this, it would be the perpendicular distance, all right? Usually they're all set up like that, but that's our principle of moments. That's it. Okay, you need to practice some of those questions. So no problems with that. When they're all balanced, the system is in equilibrium. When it's balanced, the, the, the system's in equilibrium, nothing's going to move. Right, moving on. Uh, centers of mass. Let's flick across to here. Centers of mass. Pretty easy. Center of mass is just what it says on the can, guys. It's where the mass appears to act from. It's the center of the mass, sometimes called center of gravity. Okay. And it's where something balances. So if we had a piece of card and it's a regular piece of card like this. Okay then we know it's going to balance somewhere in the middle. Okay, I can put my finger underneath there and balance it and it's just about there. The way we find the balance point is we draw the lines from there to there because it's a regular shaped object and where the lines cross, that should be our balance point, like so. Okay, now I haven't tested this, but you know, it's working, isn't it? All right. If I switch cameras for a moment, then you'll be able to see that from a different angle. Um, so let's go back to our gallery view. Here we are. And okay, hopefully you'll see there that it's balanced nicely. All right, where those lines cross. And this is a regular shaped object, but it's only a two dimensional object. Okay. Just a nice two dimensional object. If it was an irregular shape, we would call it a lamnia. Okay, just, just make it an irregular shape. Okay. That's pretty irregular. Okay, so we're making a regular shape. And now what we do, if we want to find the center of gravity now, it's slightly more tricky. I'm just going to move this on my screen, guys. There. So uh, slightly more tricky, but all we do is this, we can put a nail or a pin through the object like this. Okay. So the object's free to move. So the object's free to move. There it is. And we can make a little plumb line using our trusty rock, which is tied to our piece of string. Ideally, we would have something a bit thinner. We'd have a piece of fishing line with a weight on the, oh, with a weight on the end. And, okay, we put the, the, the bob on the end. Ignore this end of the string, guys. This, the, this is the business end, this one here. Ignore this bit. Okay. So we would mark where the string goes down on here. All right. So where the string goes down on here, we could mark that. And then we can move this round, make another hole. And then we suspend it again. And we can mark where that string goes and so on. And we do this round around the object. Okay. And then where all the lines cross, all the lines will cross where this vertical part goes down here, because it's all free to move. Okay. It'll swing and come to a halt. Where those lines cross, that's where the center of mass will be. Okay. So that would be for an irregular object, which we call a lamnia. Okay. Now, 3D objects, difficult to find the center of gravity, right? Um, very difficult to find them. But generally, what we do with a uh, 3D object is we talk about stability. So let me go back to here um, and I'm going to change the view. Bear with me guys. And hopefully you can go back to this one, right? So for a 3D object, if you've got a cone, like a triangle shape, but it's a cone, like a hat, 
There's the center of mass there. Okay, this object's very stable. This has got a stable equilibrium. If it was upside down, it would be virtually impossible to balance it because that center of mass has got to be above the base. That's an unstable equilibrium. And if it's on its side, it's neutral. Okay, it'll just roll around and go to a new location, but a similar position. Stable, unstable, neutral. Okay, so when we make things like um, buses and trains and all this type of stuff, what we try and do is we have the center of mass, that's a bus, okay? The wheels on the bus are going round and round, we all know that. We try and make the center of mass very, very low so that it's nice and stable. So if it goes around a corner and it's sloping, doo -doo -doo -doo, that's one scary bus ride. If that's your bus ride to school, guys, you're in serious trouble. So um, if there's your center of gravity there, if that's going outside the base, if it goes outside, then the bus is going to topple. Okay. So with 3D objects, we do try to have um, a nice low center of gravity for most of them to make a stable object. All right. And we need to keep that center of mass within the base. Got it. Good. What's under here? Vectors and scalars. All right. So vectors and scalars. What are, what are vectors and scalars? This is a sideline. We've discussed them already. A vector has size and direction. Now size is a nice simple word and too simple for physics. So we use the word magnitude instead. Okay, it's the same thing. All right. So it's just, just the, with size doesn't sound very physics like, does it? So we just use magnitude, magnitude and direction. So something like force, velocity, acceleration. These are vectors. Scalars only have size. Okay, which is magnitude. All right. So things like mass, temperature, time. Okay, those are scalars. They only have size. So if you give something a direction, it's a vector. But if it's only got size, it's a scalar. All right. Like length is a scalar. So it only has size. Right, you wonderful people. We are moving along quite quickly here. Um, the last little thing we're going to look at is momentum. Are we all ready for momentum? Yes, we are. Now, momentum, you already know. You, you, you would know this already, guys. Yeah? Momentum, especially if you play sport or if someone bumps into you in the corridor, momentum equals mass times velocity. Okay? Nice and easy. You work it out all the time. Yeah? If you're, walk, if you're walking down a corridor and there's some skinny little person coming towards you, they're going to bounce off you if they bump into you. Okay? But if you're wanted to cross the road and you have a look and the bus is coming, you're working out the momentum. You go, wow, that bus is big. It's going fast. I'm not, I'm not going to step off the pavement. Yeah? So momentum is mass times velocity. That's all it is. And if you play a lot of sport, guys, you factor that in if you're going to bump into somebody. All right. And you factor it in when crossing the road or going down the corridor. doesn't matter. All right. Now, what we have got, guys, is this thing called impulse. Yeah. And impulse is the change in momentum. Now, this is easy. OK. Mass times velocity is pretty easy. In a collision, momentum is conserved. So it's always conserved in collisions, all right? Momentum is always conserved in collisions. But impulse is equal to the change in momentum, okay? And impulse is something else. Now let's take a little look at this just quickly, right? Let's go back a bit. Let's wind the clock back. And let's try this. Here's an equation for you. Force equals mass times acceleration. Hey, we're all happy with that. Now, acceleration equals 
the change in velocity over the time. Okay, well, we're pretty happy with that too. So now we've got force is equal to mass there, but acceleration is this. So that's delta V over delta T. Okay, stay with me. We're pretty, we're pretty happy with that. Now, mass times velocity. Whoa, there it is. Mass times velocity is momentum. So force has got to be equal to momentum, the change in momentum, divided by change in time. Okay? So, and then if we rearrange that, we can say that delta T, the momentum, the change in the momentum is equal to the impulse. Well, that must be equal to F delta T. F equals MA, we're happy with that. A is the rate of change of velocity that goes in here. Mass times velocity, whoa, we already know that, that's momentum. If impulse is the rate of change in momentum or the change in the momentum, then the impulse is equal to force times the, the time. And what this means, guys, is here, the force that you get when you stop quickly is going to be greater than if you stop slowly. All right. So if you're if you're running for the bus and you see the bus isn't going to leave, so you slow down, no big problems. If you're running for the bus and you trip and hit the pavement and you stop quickly, if T is small, F is going to be larger. That's when you're going to get hurt. All right. So it's not a case that speed kills you. What kills you is stopping very, very, very quickly, right? Speed doesn't kill. Otherwise, you look around the plane, and you go, well, we're doing 500 miles an hour, nobody's died. It's not the speed that kills you, it's the stopping quickly. So stopping quickly creates a bigger force and that is impulse. All right, guys, we've done a lot today. So let's have a quick recap. Let's um, go back and find our view, the view which I have lost. And we've got a bit of a wobble on there with the camera. So here we are. We've done loads just then. We have got through lots of different things. We had a quick look at turning forces, okay? Um, and the principle of moments. So we looked at moments. Moments is force times distance. It's the perpendicular force and the distance from the fulcrum, okay? And remember those fulcrums um, come in all shapes and sizes. So that's going to be a tricky one. We looked at center of mass in two dimensional things, which are regular. We looked at the center of mass in a lamnia, where we use the bob, the pendulum bob or a, a plumb line to find the center, of, the center of mass. A quick look at vectors and scalars. And then we moved on to momentum, which is just mass times velocity. And the force, is equal to the rate of change of the momentum. So the impulse is the change in the momentum, but the force is the rate of change of momentum. And if you stop quickly, that's a big force. So when you're trying to slow down, if you're in the car driving, and just put the brakes on gently, there's a nice comfortable stop. If you slam the brakes on, you're gonna stop quickly, bigger force. Okay, well guys, that's about it for now.